simply. Here's how it works. Affect results in effect. Affect results in effect. Affect, think of it like this, comes as the first letter in the alphabet. It is a verb. The effect is what happens after the effect has occurred. And so I want to share a brief story with you to help you understand this. Because it is at a young age, I understood this very clearly. My brother, I can't tell you which one it is or he would get mad at me. Somehow when he was younger, he saw the movie Jaws. Now as a family, we didn't make it a habit to go around watching horror films about sharks. I don't know where he saw it. He just saw it somewhere. And I knew that I could affect him very easily if I just did the classic Jaws beat. You know it. Dinner. Dinner. Dinner, dinner, dinner. And all I would have to do, it didn't matter where we were, if I did that to my brother, he would freak out. I loved it because I could affect him at any time. The faithful moment finally came. It was dark outside. He was in the bathtub at night. Walked into the bathroom, shut the door very quietly behind me. I was like, here it goes. Shut off the light. Right when I shut it off, I went, Dana, Dana. He loses it. He screams to high heaven. Ah, mom! That's the highest you're ever going to hear me scream, so you better enjoy that, all right? He screams his head off. What happened? I affected his situation. And what was the result? The effect was he screamed. It was great. But my mom heard it. And she decided to come into the situation. And she decided to affect the situation. She said, oh, Josh, you like to scare people. Well, I happen to know that you're afraid of the dark. Which I was. She says to my brother, get out of the bathtub. She says, get in the bathtub. I get in the bathtub. I sit there. She says, you will sit in here until I come back. As she is leaving, she turns off the lights and shuts the door, and I'm sitting in the bathtub in the dark. My brother maybe screamed higher. I screamed like a little girl. I was so freaked out. So my mom came in, and she affected my situation, and as a result, my effect, my effect, was that I screamed like a little girl, which I am not going to share with you right now because it's embarrassing. Effect and effect. Welcome back to Movement Not a Moment. We are looking at how God's movement throughout history is something that we join, not just a moment to enjoy. And to help you understand this a little bit better, here's a simple diagram that I want to show you that shows how God's movement works together. And it starts with this. God affects people. Then when those people are affected by God, God calls them to affect other people. And when those people are affected, they become affected people. And then what does God do? He calls them to go and affect more people. Very simple. Affected people affect people. This is how God's movement has worked since the beginning of time. And I want to give you a quick summary of how God has moved throughout the ages. First thing that we see in creation God just said it's going to happen. He affected the situation, and as a result, everything was created. After that, he gave Abraham a promise. And that promise affected an entire nation. When that nation grew, God sent deliverers and judges and prophets and kings to guide the nation. God would come and he would tell them, this is what I want you to do. And those people would turn around and they would affect the people that they were leading. Then after that, the nation of Israel said, ah, we don't want to follow God anymore. So they started doing their own thing. As a result, God said, okay, you're going into exile. But even when they were in exile, God was still coming to people and saying, I'm going to affect you. And when you become affected with me, you need to turn around and you need to affect other people. These were people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even King Nebuchadnezzar. And then finally, Jesus sends his only son, or God sends his only son, Jesus, to come to this earth. And when he is here, he affects the entire world like no one ever has. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, we can experience forgiveness of our sins. And then after he goes into heaven, he sends the third member of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit comes down. 
and indwells the followers of Jesus. And they begin the church, the gathering. And when the church begins, this is God's greatest instrument for his movement throughout history. For the last 2,000 years, God's greatest vehicle has been the church. And the church has made a profound impact on a lot of people. I want to share with you tonight just one person. He grew up in Tarsus. He was named after the first king of Israel. His family had a long heritage of being very religious. In fact, they were part of the most religious sect at this time. And as he grew up, he decided that he wanted to follow in his family's footsteps. So more than likely, he went to Jerusalem. And when he was in Jerusalem, he sat under the teaching of one of the most powerful Jewish teachers at that time. And when he was there, he learned more about his faith, and he loved it. But then as he grew up and he became a man, he started hearing about this Jesus guy. And while he was hearing more and more about Jesus, he realized he didn't like it. He didn't do much about it because eventually this Jesus guy was crucified. And he thought, well, that's the end of that. But then something happened that made him furious. His disciples were going around, his followers, and saying, this Jesus rose from the dead. And he was the promised Messiah our nation has been waiting for. And when this man heard this, he was furious. And one day, he saw something that changed his life. He was in Jerusalem, and some people had taken one of Jesus' Jesus' followers, and they started to stone him, picking up rocks and actually stoning him to death. And when this man saw this going on, a fire lit inside of him. And he knew that he wanted to end this so-called Jesus movement and turn it into nothing but a moment. We're going to hear the rest of his story in Acts 9. If you have the light blue Bibles in front of you or the dark blue Bibles on the dark blue Bibles, it's on page 1706, light blue Bibles, 1670. If you have a Bible app, feel free to pull that out right now. And we're going to go through the rest of this man's story because it's a story of how God affects somebody, but then he also calls them to go and affect other people. Acts 9, we're going to start in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul, the man's name that I'm talking about is Saul, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. This phrase, breathing out murderous threats, means simply he was focused. With every breath, he had the intention of killing the church. You could say he was more focused than a fat kid at Thanksgiving. All right? This was all he could think about, was snuffing out this movement and make, making it nothing but a moment. Then it goes on. He went to the high priest and asked, asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. At this point, Saul has just been persecuting the church in Jerusalem, but he has heard that it's starting to spread. And he is ready to go and snuff this thing out. But to do that, he has to have the authority of the priests and the temple. Because the majority of the people that are turning to this Jesus movement are Jews. And so if the temple leaders say, go ahead and do this, he has all the authority he needs. He doesn't even have to talk to the Roman government because he has authority from his people. And so he doesn't want to just snuff it out in Jerusalem. He wants to go everywhere and kill it. It goes on. But we're going to see that God's going to affect his life. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? When he says Lord here in the Greek, this is just, he is acknowledging that he's in a presence of someone greater than himself. He is not acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. He's just saying, whoa, something's going on here. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to pay respect, and that's what he's doing. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. God affects Saul. He shows him a light. He knocks him to the ground. He actually speaks to him, and he identifies who he is. Then after that, he gives him very specific directions of what he's supposed to do. Now we're going to see 
the effect, the effect that Saul felt from this moment. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. What was the effect that Saul felt? He was extremely humbled. He couldn't see. He had to pick himself off the ground after being knocked down. And he came to Damascus with this authority and this pomp that says, I'm here to do something. And now he's being led into that very city by someone else because he can't see. And he is extremely distressed. And because of that, he doesn't even eat or drink for three days. But something is going to happen to his story. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. A disciple named Ananias, a disciple at this time was a member of the church. And if he was a disciple, that means he was affected by God. And now God is telling him, Jesus is telling him, you in turn now have to go and affect someone else. I effected you, now it's time that you go and affect someone else. And God's going to give him very clear instructions. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying in a vision. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. God says, okay, you're going to go and you're going to affect this person. He gave him very clear directions and he said, Saul has already been prepared. He's been praying and not only has he been praying, he's seen a vision of you. Now go. I love Ananias' response because when God asked me to do something, my response is much like Ananias. Look at this, verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many rumors about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. What does Ananias do? He gives them excuses. <laughs> I like the excuses. Um, I've heard a lot of rumors. Uh, yeah, this guy, he's a bad guy. He's persecuting your holy people. Uh, the church. He's throwing them into jail. And I've even heard that, yeah, he's here now to arrest people that belong to you, a.k.a. me! He's here to arrest me, and you want me to do What? Look at God's response. This is classic. I love, the Bible's amazing, guys. You gotta open it up and read it. This is amazing. But the Lord said to Ananias, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know there were rumors. I didn't know he had authority. No. What's he say? Go. Go. He doesn't give him, he doesn't give him answers to his excuses, to his fears. He doesn't even address them. But he tells them why Saul is so crucial. He says this. This man is my chosen servant, my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Why has God affected Saul? Because he's his chosen instrument to proclaim his good news to the Gentiles and the kings. But he needs to understand something. Saul needs to understand something. And this is crucial for all of us. When we decide to be used by God... It's going to be hard. If you're looking for an easy path in life, Christianity and following Jesus is not for you. It's hard, but it's worth it. And so even before God gets ready to use Saul, he says, Saul, you're going to have to understand this. You're going to have to suffer. It's going to be completely worth it, but it's going to be rough. And he explains this to him. Then, he, then look at this response. Verse 17, then Ananias went. He went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. God healed Saul physically 
His blindness was gone. And when that happened, he ate. And spiritually, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was baptized. But how did God do this? Not a trick question. He took someone that he had already effected and said, you're going to go now and affect someone else. Because this isn't just about you. And that's what Ananias did. And Ananias accepted Paul before anything happened. Right when he shows up, he says, Brother Saul. He knew that God had called him and God was going to work. Then we're going to see the results of what happened. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. (laughs) This is crazy. He joins the church. He signs up for class 101 and says, I'm in. This is nuts. He came to destroy them. And now he is a part of them. God steps in and he affects his life. And this last verse, I have to put it up here on the screen because it's so amazing. I can't just read it for you. Look at this. This is what it says. There it is. And immediately, talking about Saul, he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is indeed the son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Saul says, I have been I have experienced the effects of what God has done in my life. And because of that, I'm going to join the church, but I'm going to turn around and I'm going to start affecting other people. And when he does this, the church starts to grow. But the best thing about this whole movement is it's not dependent upon one person, but it's a person that has been effected by God, turning around and affecting someone else. Watch this short video to see what happens when affected people start to affect other people. I told you this is a movement, not a moment. Did you see kingdoms rise and fall? Did you see ideologies come and go? But this Jesus movement spread across the entire globe. Why? Because God is behind it. And how does it happen? One person that has been affected by God turns around and says, I am going to be used to affect someone else. And it spreads. 18 years ago, a group of people got together and said, we want to affect Roswell. And they planted Grace Community Church. I think they've done a really good job. Now it's our turn. I want you to pull out your cell phones and I want you to answer this question as soon as you can. What would happen if the people at Grace Sunday night, that's us, 
chose to affect the Roswell community. Those of us that have been affected by God decided we're going to turn around and we're going to start affecting this community. I don't do this often, but here you go. I'm going to pull my soapbox off the shelf. Here it is, okay? Putting it down. I'm stepping on it. Here we go. Our community will not change by public reform. Government officials will not change it. Entertainment will not change this community. If you are sitting around waiting for someone else to change the things that are going on in this place, it's not going to happen. And if you haven't noticed, it's getting a whole lot darker out there than it is getting lighter. Why? Because God is waiting for a group of people, individuals that say, I have been affected by God, and as a result, I am now going to start affecting this community and the people I live with in it. My neighbors, my family, my friends, my co-workers, my classmates, guys. The governor cannot change the circumstances that we face. Even us as pastors cannot change the circumstances out there by ourselves. It's a group of people saying, I've been affected, and now it's time to affect others. So if you're waiting for another solution... There is no plan B for this community. You're it. God says, this is your community. If you don't step up, you can't blame me. We are the ones that have been called out by him to bring his light, his love, his forgiveness, his goodness and grace to the people of Roswell. If you're waiting for someone else or the next election, you're only going to be more disappointed. And when you read more things in the headlines, you say, how is that? Oh, it's so bad. How is this happening? How is this happening? God's going to look at you and say, it is that bad. Why is this happening? Why is this happening when I have already sent you? I've placed you here for a reason. What are you waiting for? This is me getting off my soapbox, picking it up, putting it back on the shelf. Effected people affect people. And when those people are affected, that's how communities change. That's how marriages are restored. That's how relationships are brought back together. So what would this look like? A huge movement we could give glory to God for in a large amount. We would see God save marriages and change people. We would see people glorify God like never before. Revival. The town would be more at peace. Listen to this. People would have hope. It would be a movement. Last one. We could reach the people that need Christ so bad. The younger generation, the drug addicts, the alcoholics, and the downtrodden. Yeah, you get it. For that to happen, though, for those things to become a reality, there's two things that must occur right now. Go back to this chart where God affects people. Go ahead and throw that up. God affects people. Maybe you're here tonight and this is you. God has been knocking on the door of your heart much like Saul. And he has arranged circumstances. You don't even know exactly why you're here. But you know that God is drawing you and he wants to affect, effect, he wants to affect your life powerfully. He wants to take away those things that are holding you back from him. And he wants to give you a brand new life. If that's you, and you're done with running away from God, and you're ready to embrace his forgiveness for you and his love for you, I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. And all this prayer is saying is you are opening yourself up, much like Saul, to say, God, affect me in a powerful way. Because I need to be changed. If you want to pray this prayer with me in the quietness of your heart, feel free to do that. 
God, I know that I have ran away from you. And I haven't done things that I'm supposed to. I want you to be the leader of my life and the forgiver of my sins. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, God has started a process where he is going to affect you in a powerful way. Let his love fill you. Let that forgiveness that you're experiencing even right now change the way you view your life. The first thing that needs to happen is people need to be open to God's love so they can become effective. Second thing that needs to happen. Those of you that have been effective, maybe for weeks, months, maybe years, it's time. It's time to start letting God use you to affect other people. And you might have excuses like Ananias. Well, what about, there's rumors, they have authority, this might happen, that might happen. And God is all, all he's going to say, go. Effected people need to start affecting people for that to become a reality. So what I'm going to do, if you're in this category, and you've been playing it safe, you've been hiding on the sidelines, pointing your finger at everyone else and saying, why doesn't this community change? Why doesn't that person know Christ? Why doesn't that change? Maybe God is pointing the finger at you saying, I'm waiting on you. I have already affected you, and now I'm calling you to go and affect other people. If that's you, I'm going to pray a prayer of surrender. And what you're doing in this prayer is you're opening yourself up to God, much like Ananias, to say, God, whatever you want, whoever you want to send me to this week, whoever comes across my path, I will, by the power of your spirit, affect them positively for your glory. If you want to send me somewhere that's maybe a little sketchy, have a conversation that I've been avoiding for years, I'm ready. Because God is ready to move in your life. If you want to pray this prayer, you can pray in the quietness of your heart. God, I know I have been running from you. And you have called me to affect the people around me. I have excuses. I have reasons. And I'm scared. Right now, I surrender to the power of your Holy Spirit to use me in my family, with my friends, my coworkers, and in this community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to leave you with this. God's movement is something you join, not just a moment to enjoy. And we do things here in this environment that, yes, you're welcome to join. But more importantly, this needs to be a movement to join out there. Knowing this week as you're having those conversations, saying the people in this room, I might not even know who they are, they're also going to be having those conversations. And we're going to do this together because it's not dependent upon one person. But God wants to use every single one of us who have already been, who, who are effective so that we can turn around and affect other people. God's movement is something to join, something you join, not just a moment to enjoy. Let's pray. God will be the first to admit it's a lot easier to sit back and say, hey, come on down, show yourself, throw all the sinners in jail. It's 
so that it can be perfect around here for us holy people. Or to step back from the darkness because it keeps getting darker and darker every single day. And it's a lot easier to run and hide than to step forward and to be used by you. God, we all have fears. We all have concerns. We don't have this figured out. We are broken people that it's amazing we even got here tonight. But I ask that you would once again affect us in a powerful way so that we could become an effective people and we could go out and affect others. Thank you that this movement has been going on for thousands of years. And now we get an opportunity to join it with you. And it starts with the people around us and the community that we live in. Use us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. I want to invite you back next week. We have a great week next week. We're going to have a night of worship all together. John and the band, they're going to be up here. And we're just going to have a whole night together where we just create space for God to meet us in a powerful way. So if you're going to be in town next weekend, I would enjoy, invite you to come back. Also, those connection cards, if you're visiting with us for the first time, don't forget, drop those either in the box in the back or guest services where you can get a free stork coffee. At this time, I'm going to dismiss you to the 15 after party. And we just provide food and snacks. And the reason we do that is it's a great opportunity to just build community together so we can get to know each other. So I hope you guys have a great week, and I will see you next week. Thanks for coming.